So, uh, hello and uh, welcome. Um, I don't know how many of you know me, but in case you don't, uh, this, this is a little bit of uh, background information about myself. Um, I'm a software developer at Rackspace. This is a company in the, uh, in the United States. Uh, probably, if you know me, you know me because of the, uh, the Flask Mega Tutorial. This is a, a series of articles that I wrote on my blog a few years ago that, uh, that are somewhat popular. Uh, I also wrote the O'Reilly book on Flask. Uh, mostly these days I work on APIs and microservices and uh, my language of choice, probably 90% of the time I'm coding Python, but uh, sometimes I have no way to avoid writing JavaScript, uh, so I do. And I, in previous life, I used to work a lot with C++ as well. Uh, you have my, my Twitter, my, uh, my blog, which has a lot of articles about Python, in particular Flask, and uh, my GitHub uh, page where you can find a, a bunch of open source projects that I, uh, that I did. Uh, before I start, I also wanted to mention the, uh, the other two places I'm going to be available uh, in this conference. Uh, tomorrow there's a, a training session, a, a three hour long session on, on this specific topic on microservices. Uh, so tomorrow morning, uh, that's, that's when, it's, uh, when this is uh, happening. And then I'm also gonna do a, a help desk on Thursday. Uh, if you have any questions about Flask or web development or any of, of my open source projects, I'll be more than happy to, to talk to you one-on-one. -on -one. Okay. So, um, basically this is gonna be an introductory talk on microservices, probably intermediate level, uh, may maybe a, a, uh, a beginner that's ready to jump into the, this, this pool of intermediate yeah, that, that nobody knows exactly what it is. Uh, but that, that's basically the target audience. Um, so I, I'm gonna start with a uh, set of analogies. Uh, Imagine, uh, this, this is something that happened to me. I have a friend who's taking a uh, software development class. He, he's not a developer. This, this was an elective uh, class that he took in college. And he had to write a, a game, a game of Pong. And he had a bug and he, he came to ask me for help. And when he showed me his code, it, it looked pretty much like this. The whole game in a function. So he called Pong and then that, that was the game. And he had a bug with the way the ball moved, right? So, so to help him, I had to go understand pretty much the whole game, right? It, it was very hard for me to, to figure out what was going on. So I used the opportunity to show him a better way to structure this, uh, this game, right? So I, I, I told him, you, you should do something like this, where uh, you have a, a bunch of functions. Each function does one thing. And then when, when you need to do something bigger than what a function does, then you have a function that calls other functions and all the functions call each other and achieve the big thing that is the whole game, right? And uh, I'm sure we all going to agree that you know, the, the one on the right is much better than the one on the left. So here basically we're saying that you know, short and focused functions are better than long functions that do a lot of things. Now, what happens if, if we go one level above? So, this is, uh, this is an example from my book, the, the Flask book. Um, if, if you start the book, it, it teaches you how to build a Flask application, and when you reach the end of chapter six, you end up with an application that, that does quite a lot, but basically the, the whole Python logic is in this, this one module, hello.py. Then you have a bunch of templates and a bunch of uh, static files, but, but basically the whole Python thing is in one file. So, so then you, you get into chapter seven, and chapter seven is the one that teaches you how to structure your application so that it's uh, more maintainable. So, so it, it goes into something like this, where, where you have a uh, starter script, manage.py, the configuration, it's in its own module. You have uh, the application is in a package, and then the tests are in, in a different package. And if, if you keep looking, the application has uh, a couple of modules, that are for specific things, so, so the database models are in one module, email support is in another one, 
uh, there's this, uh, this main uh, folder, which is another sub-package that is a, uh, in Flask we call it a, a blueprint, which for those of you familiar with Django will be sort of the same as a Django application. And if, if, you, if you keep looking, then you have, for, for that blueprint, you have errors, forms, and views. So basically, once again, same thing as with functions, now with modules, we're saying that small and focused modules are better than large modules that do a lot of things. Right? Now, what happens if, if we take this even higher level and we, we talk about services, web applications? Well, can we translate this? So this is an example of a big web application. Uh, this is actually an application that exists. It, it, it's on my GitHub. I, I use this application to teach a class uh, to demonstrate that Flask can scale and basically the idea with this uh, application is that uh, you have these two green boxes. Uh, FLAC is the name of the application, and then uh, the Celery Worker, it, it, it's uh, uh, a, a one or more workers that do asynchronous uh, functions. And the idea is that you, you, you can run uh, any number of FLAC instances and any number of Celery Workers, and you scale those two according to your needs. Uh, then, then you have a database that both use, and there's a message queue that's used by Celery and also used to, uh, to allow the Celery workers to push uh, notifications to the client through, uh, through WebSocket. So anyway, th this is probably a, sort of an advanced-ish application, uh, very scalable, but it's, it's one code base. So can we apply the same logic that we apply to functions and modules to this? And in, in my opinion, the answer is yes. And, uh, okay, f first I should, <laughs> I should tell you about uh, the, the problems with this. Uh, so one problem that we have is that uh, the, the code is, is, is a single code base, so it's, uh, it's very hard to test. Uh, all, all the things are uh, basically coupled. You, uh, you have code that deals with users. Uh, in, in this particular case, FLAC, this example is a chat application. So, so you have code that deals with users and messages all mixed up. You don't even realize that you are, you are having uh, you know, coupling between those two potentially separate functions of this application. Uh, if, if you are working with a team and you, you need to introduce a new member to your team, uh, that person, it, it, it's gonna have a hard time trying to, uh, to figure out how to uh, become productive because it, you know, they'll have to understand a lot of things before, uh, you know, before you let them participate uh, you know, to, to reduce the risk of them uh, breaking things. Um, in particular, when you use uh, Celery, uh, something that I, I find, I, find I, I don't like that much is that uh, if, if you need to upgrade, even though in, in, in this case we have two separate services, the, the, the main service and the Celery, uh, they all come from the same code base, so there's no way to upgrade them separately. You have to stop both, or if you have many instances of each, all, all of that you need to stop. Then you do the upgrades, upgrade the database, whatever else you need to do, and then you start them again. So, so basically you have to take your application down for the upgrade. Uh, also, if, if you have a problem and the application crashes, then uh, basically the whole application crashes and the site goes down until you figure out what's, what's going on and you can restart it. Uh, the scaling becomes difficult. Uh, imagine in, in the case of a chat application like this, uh, so, so you have a, a module that deals with users, a module that deals with uh, messages. Uh, very likely there's gonna be more activity on the messages side than in the user side, right? You're gonna have a, you know, a bunch of regular users that are already registered and then they're gonna be chatting, so they're gonna be sending a lot of messages. So if, if, if you find that you need to, uh, to scale your application, you're gonna be scaling the whole service. So you're gonna have uh, you know, the, the, necessary, uh, the necessary number of instances to satisfy the, the load for the messages, but then you're gonna also be having a lot of instances that can deal with users that are not there. You're gonna be uh, over, uh, over scaling for the user side, and there's no way to have more fine control. Uh, the only control is basically the, the salary versus the rest, the, the main service. Uh, 
Also, consider the case where, uh, let, let's say this is an old application, you, you, you did it in Python 2, and now you are interested in going to Python 3. And that, that's going to be probably going to give you a headache, right? Because it's all or nothing. You're going to have to upgrade the whole, uh, the whole application in one go. So all, all these are problems that are typical of, of what we call monoliths. So, so the, these big applications that are, uh, that are built with a single code base. Now, this is also a real application. It's the same application. It's also on my GitHub. It's converted to this idea of microservices. And uh, you, you can probably guess that the idea is basically to write smaller services, and the services then talk among themselves to achieve you know, the, the whole function of the application. And in this case, uh, you, you can see we went from two green boxes to five, and Celery is not there anymore. So, so we have uh, five services. Uh, uh, you can see uh, in, in the bottom, you can see the client UI. So this is a service that serves the, uh, the application that runs in the browser. Uh, for this particular case, I wrote that in Python. Uh, in, in most cases, I'm going to guess that this is going to be a node application. And that's totally fine because you know, they're, they're independent services. You can write uh, each service with, with uh, the, the best technology uh, for, for that service. So we have a client UI. We have a service that deals with tokens. Uh, that basically, this is authentication. Uh, messages and users are separate services. And then we have the socket IO service, which is the, the web socket uh, push notification um, module. So they're all separate. In this case, these are all Flask applications. Some of these are so small that uh, you can open them in your screen and see the whole code. Uh, and, and the ones that you don't, they're probably two screens, no, no more than that. They're, they're, they're all you know, fairly small. Um, you can see that uh, we, we, we went from two orange boxes. We, we had a database and a uh, message queue on the monolithic case. Now we have four boxes. We, we still have the message queue that, that uh, serves the same function. It helps the, uh, the, the services communicate among themselves. Uh, but then we have three databases. Uh, we have a, a database for the messages service, database for the user service, and a database for the token service, which uh, stores revoked uh, tokens. Uh, and then what else do we have? We have a, uh, a new box, a blue box, called service registry. Uh, I, I'm going to talk about that uh, more later, but basically this is a, uh, a very efficient database that keeps track of all the services that are running. It knows what's running, and then it communicates with the load balancer, so that the load balancer knows uh, what, what, to, you know, what, what the services are. Now, uh, these uh, five green boxes, they're all uh, independently scalable now. So, so now, if, if I have uh, more, uh, more load on the messages side, I can run more, uh, more uh, instances of messages and then keep users you know, at, at one or two, uh, for example. So uh, I talked about you know, disadvantages of the monolith, and all, all of those now translate into benefits uh, when we're doing microservices. The code complexity, it's, it's you know, greatly reduced. Each service, as, as I said, it's a very small Flask application, uh, you know, reminiscing of the, the hello world type application you see in uh, documentation. Uh, they're actually very simple to, uh, to code, very simple to maintain, uh, because we're forced to keep things separate. It's less likely that we're going to introduce bugs due to coupling. Uh, the user service has no way to access, for example, the messages database directly. It needs to talk to the messages service. So messages will have a public API that will expose to, uh, to clients or to other services. The users will, will do the same thing. And uh, basically, that, that's a decoupled design you know, by force. You, you're basically, uh, the, the, this design promotes the decoupled design that helps, uh, helps create programs to have less bugs. Uh, now, the, the, the case of having a, a new member in the team uh, that, uh, that you want to, uh, to, to, to make productive as soon as possible, uh, that, that becomes uh, really easy because you, you, you can put that person to work on one of the, your simplest services. And uh, like in the case of Pong, if you have you know, the, the code structure with functions, if I need to fix how the ball moves, I don't need to learn how the, uh, you know, how the players move or how the collisions happen. All I need to do is uh, 
basically you go to the, the function that moves the ball. And this is the same thing. You, you can put a, uh, a new developer to work on the, uh, on the token services, for example. The token services is very simple. And uh, you know, right away they, they can start uh, being productive. Uh, you, you, can, you can even uh, allow a new person to create a new service because it, it's, it's a very simple application. Uh, one of the things that I find uh, most exciting is that you, you can uh, upgrade like the big guys do without uh, going down. We, we never find out when uh, Facebook, Twitter, etc., uh, you know, deploy upgrades because they do it you know, while running and we, we can do the same with this. Uh, I, I'm going to show you an example of that later. Probably you don't believe me, but you know, give me you know the benefit of the doubt. I'll, I'll show you in a little bit. Uh, if you have a problem with a, a service that crashes or has bugs or whatever, uh, that's going to affect a small part of your application. The rest of the application will continue to work. So uh, unless you're unlucky and your token service goes down, which basically means that nobody will be able to authenticate. If, if, uh, if you have a big application with lots of services uh, and one minor service uh, goes down, then the rest of the application will continue to work. So it, it, it's a partial uh, failure, not, not a complete failure like the case of a monolith. Um, uh, I, I, I mentioned that you can scale individually the services and adapt to the loads. Uh, and finally, also very important, uh, you, you can choose the best technology stack for each service. They don't need to be all written in Python 2 or Python 3. They can all be written in the best tool. Um, and in, in, in the example of going from Python 2 to Python 3, if, if you started this application with Python 2, then you could start migrating services one by one to Python 3. And as long as the communication mechanisms between your services uh, is standard, so you, you, you will do, for example, HTTP, for example, uh, then everything will continue to work and you can do a gradual upgrade to a new technology. Um, likewise, if, if you find that you need to write a new service and uh, for some reason you find that uh, Go or Node or Ruby is, is a best choice, then it's absolutely no problem. You, you can do that service in, the, uh, in, in a different technology and uh, that it, it doesn't really matter. Uh, of course, uh, it's not you know, all roses and uh, you know, benefits. There are some, uh, some problems too. Uh, wh one problem that I see, uh, you know, I, I, I enforce the, the, the fact that things become simpler. Uh, this, this is really true, but not, not so much. Uh, the complexity doesn't go away completely. Uh, the complexity goes into the, uh, if you look at the diagram, it goes into the, the arrows. So the complexity migrates from inside the green boxes into the arrows, and now you have a, a web of connections that sometimes gets pretty crazy. So you have to make sure that, uh, for example, uh, you don't have a cyclic uh, links. The service calls service A calls service B, and then B eventually ends up calling service A again. You know, you, you may need to look for inefficiencies in, in, in that sort of thing. Um, I, I, I suggested by showing the, uh, the, the boxes that each service has its own database. So something that uh, people like me, which uh, like relational databases a lot, uh, I, I suffer with uh, being unable to, to do joins because now each service has its own database. So if, if you need to create a join in this example between users and messages, you have to do it in the application. There's no way to, to use SQL because it, it's two databases and you know, one service cannot access the database from the other, and we don't want to, uh, to, to keep things separate and uh, be able to upgrade uh, these services separately. Um, deployments are hard, and, uh, you know, DevOps people will tell you that. Uh, you know, it's just security for, for DevOps people, but, uh, you know, th there are so many moving pieces that, uh, you know, it, it requires a full-time job sometimes to, uh, to keep things going when we have uh, this type of architecture. And then finally, uh, you, uh, you have uh, this, this pinball effect, right? Each service does uh, small things. So when, when uh, the client requests a complex uh, action, then that, that may require, usually requires, a request to pinball through different services, right? A, the, the, the entry service could be messages. Messages may need to talk to tokens to verify the authentication. It may need to talk to users to get user information. You may need to talk to Socket.io to, to push a notification to the client, so basically it becomes uh, less efficient. 
So you have to keep that in mind too. So response times for the client, they're not gonna be as great as when you have a single code base. Uh, so you, you may wonder uh, how do you go about transforming or converting or refactoring uh, a monolithic application into microservices. And unfortunately, that's, that's pretty hard. And uh, but basically, the, the, there are three main strategies. Uh, the, the one that's the, probably the easiest is to say, okay, what I have so far, I'm going to keep. I'm not gonna worry about that. But then anything new that I start building from now on, I'm gonna build uh, you know, using small services, microservices. That's, that's the easiest strategy, not, not the greatest one because you still have a monolith that you need to grandfather into your uh, microservices platform. Um, another uh, option would be to, uh, to start with the, the big service, in incorporate that, but then over time you start breaking away parts of that big application uh, into small services. So eventually over time, you are going to end up with a microservices architecture that's uh, pure, uh, but, but then there's gonna be a potentially long transition time where you will be, uh, you will be working with a hybrid. Uh, that's probably what most people do uh, when, when they do this. And then finally, you, 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 can, you, you can use the line in the sand approach and say, okay, I'm going to refactor this application into microservices you know, today. Uh, and it may take you a week or two weeks or a month but then when you're done, then you have a complete application that's, uh, uh, you know, that, that's fully uh, microservices enabled. Uh, uh, something that's important, I, I see a, a lot of uh, projects that they say, okay, I'm gonna do microservices, and all they do is start writing services. And that's probably, uh, I would say 50% of the equation. Uh, you need to have a platform that's proper for microservices to live. Uh, and, and basically this, if, if, if we, what's, okay. If, if we go to the, sorry. If, if we go to the diagram, uh, this is uh, basically the, the load balancer and the service registry are very important components. That, uh, that need to be in place. Even if you have a, a monolith that you are transitioning into microservices, you have to figure out a way to incorporate that monolith uh, into the, the platform that allows microservices to exist. I, I'm gonna describe what that means. Um, but bef before I, I get into a little bit more theory, I'm, I'm gonna do a demo. And then if, if, if I run out of time, then at, at least I, I get the, the fun part done. So, uh, okay, so, so this is this, this, uh, this microflag application. So I'm gonna show you, uh, let's see. So I'm gonna log in. It, it's basically a chat application, uh, pretty standard. So I, I can go to another tab. You, you can see that things are, oh look, I have two bulbs. That's probably the example of playing with this uh, before. Uh, so now I can, I can create another user, you know, so pretty simple stuff. Um, but let's, uh, let's look under the hood a little bit. And this is probably gonna be, whoa, what, what's this? Uh, so th this is uh, an open source load balancer. So the, the, the yellow, uh, the yellow, uh, box that you saw on the diagram uh, on the left. Uh, it's called HA Proxy. Probably, you, you, uh, if, if you don't know this one, you probably know Nginx. Uh, maybe you know Traffic, which is another one that's, uh, that's kind of becoming popular these days. Uh, so all, all the, these tools do is uh, basically you tell them, uh, you know, where, where are your services, and then uh, you have clients connect to this thing. And this is sort of a, a switchboard, a, control, uh, a, a traffic control that uh, basically shares uh, all the requests that come from clients uh, among all your instances. Now, it, 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 this, this is super busy. I'm not gonna explain everything because it, it's irrelevant to our purposes here. But uh, if, if, you, if you look at the, the, the sections, there are six sections. The, the top section basically shows you status about uh, the, uh, this, this tool, HA Proxy, listening to requests. We're gonna ignore that. Uh, there's five more sections. 
And these, uh, these five sections are for the five services that we have, these five green boxes. And you can see that uh, messages is running three instances. We're running uh, version four of the messages service, and we have three. So when requests come to, uh, to this load balancer, they're going to be assigned to one of these three. And basically, HA proxy would make sure that all three stay um, more or less equally busy. Uh, we have one of Socket.io, we have two of tokens, and then one of UI and one of users. So you can see that I'm scaling uh, independently. Um, so this is all running in a Vagrant machine, so I'm going to log in to show you some uh, fun stuff. So uh, one thing I should say, uh, you, you probably used to hear microservices associated with uh, you know, platforms like uh, Kubernetes, you know, that type of thing, which you can use. Uh, I'm not using that, that right now. Uh, this, this is all, you know, I'm, I'm a Flask guy. I like simple stuff. So th this is all built uh, using Bash and a little bit of Python. Uh, so this platform doesn't use uh, any, you know, professional, you know, professional grade uh, uh, microservices platform. Uh, I have HA proxy, I have a service registry, and then uh, a little bit of Bash. Uh, so, for example, uh, I have a bash script that runs a new service. So I can say, uh, for example, let's, let's run users. Uh, oops, add users. So this, this is going to run a new container. This is all based on Docker containers. So I'm running a second users. You, you are going to see in a little bit, uh, HA proxy, please upgrade and show me too. There we go. So, the, uh, the, the way HA proxy upgrades is a little bit clunky, it blanks the screen, but that doesn't mean it goes down, it's just the, the, the web uh, panel that, uh, that it's a little bit clunky. But anyway, you can see at the, at the very bottom, now I have two users. So all I did was uh, run this, uh, and I can show you, uh, okay, this looks awful, but uh, somewhere in here, here at the top you have the new, this is the new uh, users uh, container that I started. So just by starting the container, uh, the container itself talks to the service registry, which is this database that, uh, that knows about everything, and then the service registry knows about it, and that, that gets communicated to HA proxy. So HA proxy puts that service online immediately. Now, uh, I'm gonna just be nasty here, and uh, I'm going to kill that guy. So, the moment I stop it, HA proxy is going to notice that something's going not right. So it's going to blacklist that, uh, that service. So immediately, you know, any, any requests that are coming, they're going to go to the, the good one, the, the other one, right? And uh, in, in a few more seconds, since this isn't coming back, then it's going to go away completely. Uh, so, so this, this is one cool thing that you can do with microservices. It's super easy. You start and stop things. Uh, I mentioned before that upgrades are really fun and uh, very efficient. So uh, as soon as this, uh, this red guy goes away, I'm going to show you that. I have another, uh, another bash script uh, that's, uh, that's going to upgrade messages. I have three, there you go. I have three messages instances uh, that are running before. Now, on this instance, I have uh, already here a version 5 that I'm about to deploy. So I'm going to say MF upgrade, role messages. And pay attention to what happens now. So you are going to see a V5 messages come up. Please. Thank you. Um, so, so uh, one v five, and now one v four is going down. And another v five is going to come, and another v four is going to go down. So, so basically, as you see, there's always at least three that are running. So we never stop. We never have. Uh, we never have less than three, which is what we intended, uh, that are running. Eventually, you know, the, the, the 3v4s are going to be killed and they're going to be replaced by the 3v5s. Uh, we have one more that needs to go down. 
There you go. So that, that's how you do uh, an upgrade without stopping. So, so at, 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 you know, at this time, if, if, if I look at uh, these, these two guys, they're still running. Somehow I got two bulbs there, but other than that, uh, these, these are still connected. They never lost the connection. Uh, so, so people using this uh, service will never notice that you're doing an upgrade. Okay, so that was the demo. Uh, so in, in the time I have left, uh, okay, not much. <laughs> yeah, so five minutes. In five minutes, I'm gonna try to rush through this. Uh, I, I'm gonna describe the, the pieces that, uh, that make this, uh, that the build is. Uh, so, so we have a load balancer. I, I mentioned that I'm using HA proxy. Uh, Basically, having a load balancer when you're doing microservices is, is a must. You, you can try to, to not use a load balancer, but it's re really you lose a lot of benefits. Uh, uh, you, you, you basically get to do very simple rolling upgrades. I showed you a bash script that can do a rolling upgrade without going down. Uh, and, and that's only because we have a load balancer that, uh, that supports this, uh, this architecture. Uh, you can do A-B testing, uh, green blue deployments, and you know, all, all these cool things. You, you hear the, you know, the, the, the very popular companies, the, the, Facebooks, the Facebooks and the Netflixes talking about that they do, uh, the Chaos Monkey, you know, all those things you, you can do. Uh, and and the, the load balancer is the main piece that supports this. So uh, super important that you have one in place before, we, before you start doing this. Uh, the service registry, is, it, it's a uh, database that usually uh, it's designed to be highly available. You run multiple instances of it, uh, so it's redundant, uh, and uh, basically super fast. It caches uh, stuff in memory so that you can uh, you, you can do queries that are uh, very quick. And uh, basically, the service registry uh, is uh, basically connected from uh, all the services when they start, so they register themselves, and then uh, if the service dies. The, the, the connection the, depends on the system, but usually the, the connection uh, has a TTL. So if, if the service doesn't refresh that connection and says, hey, I'm still here, hey, I'm still here, when stop saying that, then the service registry will remove it. And then immediately we'll talk to the load balancer and it, it'll remove it from the load balancer as well. So basically that, that, that's the whole magic. Uh, if, if, if you wanna know, I didn't put it here, but. The, the registry that I'm using is another open source project. It's called etcd, etcd. It's, it's very simple. It's actually the one that uh, Kubernetes uses as well. Uh, containers are a, a big part. Usually you, you see microservices platforms are uh, always done with containers. It's only because it, it makes things uh, much more uh, easy. Uh, the container provides a layer of isolation. Uh, a little bit better than just processes. Uh, for example, it allows you to, uh, to work with uh, virtualized network ports. Uh, all, all these services that you've seen, the, these five services in the example, uh, plus all the instances of all these services, they're all running on port 5000, which is the Flask default. And, uh, and then Docker takes care of you know, mapping that into some other port that I don't even care. Right? I, I don't care what port it is. Uh, but, but you know, for me, writing the services, I, it's poor 5,000 every time. So that, that's really nice. Uh, you, you can do that yourself if you don't use Docker, uh, but you know, it, it makes things a lot more difficult. Uh, and of, of course, if you're using different, different technologies, uh, then having containers uh, makes sure that you don't have collisions between conflicting dependencies as well. Um, we, we have the orange boxes, so storage. Uh, your, your storage uh, containers, uh, usually your database, your service registry can also be considered storage, a message queue, you know, all, all of those. Uh, for all of those, for a production platform, you will, you will look for something that's highly available, something that you can uh, make clusters of. So typically, if, if you're using, for example, MySQL, you, you will look at Galera, uh, which is a cluster solution, uh, or Aurora if you're on AWS, you know, all, all those things that uh, basically make the service very reliable. Uh, not, not running one instance that if it dies, then it, the whole thing goes down, right? Uh, and the same thing for queues and, uh, and so on. Uh, and then you have your applications. So these, these are the green boxes. And these applications are stateless. So uh, I need to rush. 
uh, th these are stateless, so that that what allows me uh, allows me to start and stop these services. They have no data in them. They use the storage services to store data. So th this allows me to start, kill, and it doesn't really matter. They all uh, they're basically disposable. Uh, I, I can horizontally scale them for free. I can run as many as I want, and uh, basically the more I run, the more load I can handle on that service. Uh, and I think I'm going to skip this one in the uh, spirit of saving time. I, I already talked about this. Um, basically, the lifestyle of the microservice, it starts to talk to the, ser to the uh, service registry, and then when it dies, stops talking to the service registry, and then that, that translates into the load balancer, removing it from, from its uh, configuration. And then finally, uh, we have service-to-service uh, -service communication, which is the, uh, the mechanism by which the services uh, talk among themselves. In this example, I'm using HTTP as a way for internal communication. Uh, there are many projects that decide to only use HTTP for, for a client communication into the, uh, into the project, but then internally they use different mechanisms, which is totally fine, as long as it is a mechanism that doesn't restrict your choices of technologies. So you, sh you should find uh, standard RPC mechanisms, for example. That would be uh, a very good way to uh, to do a more efficient, uh, less chatty communication than HTTP. Uh, so I I'm going to give you a link to the slides, but if, if you want to try this example yourself, you can. This runs in a Vagrant uh, virtual machine. Uh, these are the instructions and the requirements. Uh, you, you can run this application and play with it like I played here. Uh, and uh, tomorrow I'm going to talk in more detail about this, if, if you want to learn how this was built. Phew. Thank you. Uh, you. You can see the, uh, the slides over there. Thank you. Thank you very much for this mm -hmm. nice presentation. We do have time for questions. Ah, very close. Thanks for the presentation. Uh, my question is, can there be a difference between running two instances of the same microservice into Docker containers on the same machine? and running just one instance in one Docker container. So can it help with load balancing? Are there cases when it can help? Uh, well, I'm not sure if I understand your question, but uh, typically you will not run uh, your, let's say you have uh, three instances, you are probably going to run them in different hosts. And then the load balancer is going to be you know, in front of all, all those. And the reason is that if, if the host goes down, you don't want you know, all your instances to go down. So there is no case usually when you would run two microservices into Docker's on the same machine, right? I'm, I'm sorry, I, I, I can't hear you well. I, uh, should I, 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 I know you, you're asking about something specific, but I... Yeah, I mean, can there be a case when we have two microservices into Docker containers and they are on the same machine because uh, they would have different processes and uh, is there a case when it could help uh, uh, well, with load balancing? Because uh, it, it's totally fine. You, you, you mean if, if there are collisions between the, the, the two containers? No, I mean, would it make sense in any case? What, what makes more sense is to, to use different hosts. OK, uh, thank you. But yeah, uh, just, that was my question. Basically. I mean, uh, yeah. only for, for reliance, right? You, you, you don't want you know, a host, a Docker host, to go down and take all your instances of a service. Mm -hmm. So, so you, you will have even different data centers, right? If, if you are you know, doing this for real. Right. OK, thank you. Mm -hmm. yeah. Any more questions? Hi, thank you very much. I was wondering, what's the best practice for up rolling upgraded microservices like you just did when one service is changing the data scheme and the other one isn't? Yeah, right? So, uh, uh, yeah, I, I, I didn't expect to have time to talk about this, but glad, glad you asked. Uh, there are some rules. Uh, so when you make upgrades to the database, that, that, that's not the only case, but if, if you make upgrades to the database, they need to be backwards compatible always. Uh, the same thing with the API. So, so if, if your service, uh, you know, your service ex exports an API that other services and clients uh, use, the, if, if you make changes to that, they cannot be breaking changes. So in my example here, when I went to V4, you know, V4 to V5 of, of a service, 
I need to make sure that I can have V4 and V5 running at the same time using the same database. So uh, usually if, if you need to make uh, significant changes to your database, you need to make them in stages. You cannot make them like in one go. You cannot remove a column, for example. You can deprecate a column, you know, deploy the upgrade. Once you know, you, you're all upgraded, only then when you make sure that no instances are using that column, then, then remove it in a second step. It, it's more difficult, yeah. It's, it's a pain, actually. OK, one more question. Hi, very interesting talk. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I've got one question. If you split up your uh, big application into many that keep the data in different databases, how do you keep your database backups consistent? Uh, how you keep uh, you, you, you basically each service is independent, so you, you have to back up everything separately. Uh, it, it can be in, in its own schedule. You, they don't need to be done, uh, you know, at the same time or anything. Okay, so it's you have to split up your transactions so that what has to be in one transaction has to be in the same database. Then, mm -hmm. okay, thank you. Right. Okay, we have time for one last question. Hello. Um, so if you are upgrading your database, you were saying that uh, the instances of the microservices shouldn't have any data and they can be closed at any time. But if you are upgrading the database, how do you uh, maintain the data? Because the services shouldn't be holding this data. Uh, well, so, so yeah, but basically that's the same question uh, before. It, it, it's difficult. You have to design your database upgrades so that they, are, that they don't break existing application, the, the existing version of the instance. Uh, so it typically re requires multiple stage approach to, to make significant changes. And usually you try to avoid making big changes. Uh, usually you add stuff, uh, but never remove or rename, uh, you know, because those are kind of expensive to, uh, you know, to, to deploy uh, you know, because of all the effort and, and the risk of breaking something. So, so, so yeah, typically you, you start thinking, you know, probably now if, if you've never done it, it, it sounds crazy. And I, I was in that same position a couple of years ago. Uh, but, but then you get used to, to that and then you start thinking in, uh, you, know, in, in, you know, designing your database, you know, so that you don't have to make, uh, you know, breaking changes so often. Of course, if, if, if you need to make a breaking change, then, you know, you, you can make an exception and say, okay, this time I'm gonna stop everything, upgrade, then start everything, and, and then there's some downtime. You, you, you can go that route too. Uh, another option is to use uh, NoSQL no databases, which I, you know, I, I'm, I'm a big fan, I'm old guy, so I, I, I'm traditionally trained. I, I like relational, but, uh, but I have to agree that, you know, for, for this type of architecture, NoSQL makes a lot of sense. You know, because it, it's a lot easier, there's no schema to, to, you know, to deal with. Okay, thank you very much, Miguel. Thank you.